like he was doing things that were just badass. That was one of the coolest moments of my life. I was really scared, but knowing that Dan had the gun, I did have the rifle, like we would be okay. All right, guys, welcome back to the show. And on the line with me right now is Slade Johnson. And this guy has done it right. I mean, he figured out the algorithm for getting hunts all over the place with his company Trips for Trade. Um, I'll let you kind of explain more about that here in a second. But welcome to the show. Hey, man, thanks for having me on. Excited to chat for a little bit. Yeah, it's going to be good. I, uh, I, I saw the title like when you sent me an email. And I saw trips for trade and I, immediately I was like, I'm pretty sure I know what this is all about <laughs> because it's a great idea. And I think a lot of guys have been doing it for a long time. They just haven't had the avenue to make it official or make it more professional. Exactly. Yeah. We, you know, even coming with a name, we wanted a name that was like, all right, I, I've got a good idea of what this is without, uh, you know, I haven't put much too much thought into it, but, but yeah, it's, it's an age old concept, man. We've, um, my, I grew up, my grandfather was doing it with friends and friends my whole life. And uh, we always shared our property and, 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 you know, he was swapping trips. And so um, there's a bunch of forums that we saw where, where people were trying to do it, but, um, but the forums really just lacked a lot of credibility. So we wanted to build the website that had the listings, the photos, uh, kind of the middleman there to, to help, you know, help people be more successful with it. Yeah, that's awesome. So, so you came up with this idea and then when did you officially kind of kick it off we say official was uh 2017 uh spring of 2017 um it's been an idea for for several years before that but i was in college at the time and trying to figure out how to get a business started and a website built that's very customized uh, it's not a simple landing page that that you can just put some product in a shop on it's it's a lot of pages i mean we've got thousands of pages on this website um and so it was a tough time. We got screwed over by a few different developers early on and, um, and that hurt us and pushed us back. And then the very first year we restricted it to just people I personally knew, like we wouldn't let people in unless I knew them just to get some proof of concept there and uh, had, had really good success connecting those guys. And then we opened the floodgates and uh, opened it to the public, man. And so it's, it's been awesome. We're, we're still just trying to grow it every day. That's cool. How, uh, how like, what's the demographic? Is it, like a large majority whitetail hunters or is it kind of everything like turkey waterfowl elk you name it yeah so it's a little bit of everything and uh and just to give a, i guess a high level overview real quick for anybody listening is um essentially it's just a platform for swapping trips so our, our four categories are outdoors adventure vacation and sports and so people can swap anything in between those categories we just say that we're targeting that outdoorsman so that might be somebody has a lake house that they want to swap for an offshore fishing trip, or uh, maybe they want to swap skiing in the mountains for, you know, a big whitetail hunt. So, you know, really it's any, any kind of experience you can trade that. Um, but our, our demographic is outdoorsmen, but it's all across the board from there, from um, like I said, anything from whitetail to elk to fishing to you, you name it. Um, we do have a big demographic of turkey hunters. A lot of guys, that's how all this got started with my story. And, uh, with the grand slam and, and trying to finish that for turkey hunting. And um, anyways, that's, we've seen a lot of people using this as a, a tool to check off the grand slam or maybe the super slam of all 49 states in the U S but, but we've got everything, man. We're in all 50 states and 12 different countries now. Wow. That's awesome. Where, uh, where are you at on your grand slam and uh, uh, super slam? Super slam. Yeah, I actually finished the Grand Slam through Trips for Trade after we built it. Uh, so that first year, 2017, or I guess 2018, they're running together now. But I, I was able to swap and um, and finish the Grand Slam. So that was that was like number one on my bucket list. And, and it was cool to be able to achieve that through Trips for Trade. But um, but yeah, so now I'm working on the Super Slam. And um, right now, I think I'm in like 12 states. Um, so still got a long ways to go. It'll be a lifetime accomplishment. But uh, we're actually about to start doing some filming this year and kind of do a YouTube series and, and try to document that man just swapping for these other states and, and checking it off the list. So i um, excited to, 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 you know, keep experiencing new hunts and new places and really building those relationships out. That's awesome. Yeah. If you, uh, if you haven't hit Missouri and Wisconsin already, I've got some connections in both those places for you for turkeys, at least. Um, we, we've had some really good success out here in recent years. 
last year I turkey hunted and so I'm not huge into turkey hunting. I kind of got into it a couple of years ago and there's so many turkeys out here. And I don't know if, because there's so many, they don't just like, they don't just come in ready to fight. Like I see in a lot of videos, but all of my turkeys have been killed unconventionally. Like I spot them and then I have to sneak through the woods and get close and try to cut them off. But, uh, <laughs> last year I did that and I shot this bird that I, I had him on trail camera. He had a huge beard and I'm like, this is a monster turkey. Like, I don't know much about it. I've never got one officially scored or anything like that, but I end up shooting this guy and I, I tape out the beard and I'm like, I don't know what a big beard is. I think over 10 is a big beard. And this thing had 11 and seven eighths inch beard. <laughs> and I was like, Holy cow, this is awesome. Didn't think anything of it. Didn't take it in. And then this year I shot a Turkey that was like 25 and a half pounds. Sure. And my buddy's like, dude, you, I, well, first I didn't weigh it. I just picked it up and we doubled up on these birds and my bird weighed like 10 pounds more than his. I was like, this thing's a pterodactyl. And he's <laughs> like, he's like, dude, you need to get that officially weighed. Like you might have a state record or a County record or something like that. And I was like, all right. So I start looking it up. And as I'm looking through all the information, I come across the beard length for the state record and it was 11 and a half inches. And I'm like, Oh man, yeah. I would have had the state record last year had I taped that thing out. But I ended up coming up like two pounds shy of the state record for weight. But I was like, man, this is getting me excited because I got another bird on camera uh, probably two weeks ago. And I, I would guess his beard just based on the pictures close to 12 inches long. I mean, it's a monster and he's got a double beard. The, the second beard's like probably six or seven. So <laughs> and I'm slowly getting the turkey bug. I'm not 100% yeah. there yet, but I'm I'm getting close. So, yeah, yeah. if you want to come out, man, we can definitely <laughs> talk about swapping some trips for a, a southwest Missouri turkey. And then Wisconsin as well, my cousin, he had, I can't remember what the numbers were now. I think he had like 13 or 14 people that he was trying to get birds for. And he got all but one of them in like a six-day period. So, I mean, Dude, they yeah, hammer them. them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's awesome, man. I love that. That's, that's, you're speaking my language. I love turkey hunting. I've gotten really big into bow hunting, but, um, but I still love turkey hunting. It's one of my favorite things, mm -hmm. man. It's awesome. Yeah. I hear people, I mean, I didn't grow up turkey hunting at all. I grew up waterfowl and deer hunting primarily. And people were like, dude, turkey hunting. Once you start turkey hunting, you won't care about anything else. And I'm like, I don't know about that. I like this stuff quite a bit. And then I started getting into it here with my buddy. But it, like I said, I think if I had a single Tom just come in ready to strut that I was able to pull the trigger on, I'd probably be hooked. Um, yeah. I had a bunch last year that came in, they came right up to the fence, but we were hunting on a property line. And so they stayed on the other side of the fence. And so I heard him spitting and drumming. That was the first time I'd ever heard that. And I was like, Ooh, man, I could, I could get behind this. No doubt, man. That's, that's, yeah, like I said, that's really when you get hooked is when uh, you call one in and, and you get to see the whole show. Uh, ambushing is part of it too, man. It's fun and it happens sometimes. That's just how you got to kill them. But, uh, but getting to experience the whole show with strutting and gobbling and coming to you, like it's something about it. It's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. So how many, how many trips have you done now through trips for trade? I've done a lot, man. I do probably, um, it just depends three to five a year. Probably. Uh, we usually do a couple turkey hunts, then a couple hog hunts, maybe, um, done some deer, but, but yeah, we're, our, we got a farm in West Alabama that, that we swap on and, um, really good turkey hunting, uh, covered up in hogs and man, hogs have been real, um, a real popular trip. So we've just this last week I had a guy from Ohio come in and um, he killed his first hog. First day we got there and within 30 minutes he sp spot and stalked with his bow and killed one. And then we uh, we pulled out the thermal and killed some that night. And then uh, he, he took his AR the next day and killed some. So he had Jeez. an awesome trip. It was uh, it was a lot of first for him and we're, we're all about first and um, so anyways, that was, that was cool. Now I'm gonna go up to, um, Ohio and hunt with him this year for archery whitetail. So I'm looking forward to that already, man. But, but yeah, try to do a couple every year. That's cool. Well, and especially with a property that's got hogs on it, that's like a, that's like the best <laughs> type of trade ever. Like we need these hogs gone. It's not like he's coming down and killing your, you know, 
five-year-old bucks. <laughs> He's just taking out pests that you want gone anyways. That's kind of a cool deal. No doubt. Yeah, it's it's been cool. That's the thing. We've been looking at trapping the pigs on our property, and it's like we, you know, it's really good for swaps. Like, I don't know if we want to try to try to trap them quite yet, but they reproduce so quickly, man. It's just you can't get you can't get control of them. Oh yeah. We've got we've got pigs here on our farm. Um, we've got like three breeder sows and a and a boar. Okay. And I've realized just how quickly those things reproduce. It's like as soon as one litter's out the boar is already mounting the sow and you know, she's pregnant again. And we've got, I mean, we've probably had 70 pigs since we've lived here and we've only been here for a year and a half now. And I'm like, that's just between one boar and three sows. I can't imagine out in the wild. Oh Luck yeah. Luckily it's we haven't, we haven't had too much of an issue with them here in Southwest Missouri. I know if you go over to Oklahoma, uh, it gets really bad. Um, and then down in Arkansas has got a problem. It seems like the whole Southern part of the country is getting bad and they're kind of creeping their way up. Yeah, it's expanding for sure, man. Like I said, that reproduce rate is, is just unreal. But yeah, they're fun, they're fun to shoot too. And they're fun to swap for. Cause you ain't gotta, uh, like I said, you can just, if you see them, kill them. It doesn't, you're not, oh, is yeah. it old enough? You know, is it big enough? Like it's no, it's kill them. It, it needs to go. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's turned into a huge, uh, economic deal for a lot of states. Like when we went, I did, I've done one hog hunt in Oklahoma and these guys do the same type of deal. They trap them, but then they put them in a high fence so that they're not reproducing out in the wild. And so yeah. then people just come in and kind of shoot them here and there. But when we were out there, uh, I, I could only shoot one, like they had it limited to one per person in the high fence area. And I walk in there and within like five minutes, I've got 40 pigs running at me down the trail. And so I like tucked back behind a tree, like I'm, a, I'm about to get trampled. And <laughs> I stepped out when they got close and they all took off. And there was probably 15 piglets just all running around. And they went and like hid underneath the tree trunk that, that was <laughs> a fallen tree. And I walked over and I sat on the tree trunk and these piglets are just passed out right underneath me. I was like, this is so weird, man. Just wild <laughs> pigs hanging out underneath me. And then I thought I should probably get out of here because if mama comes back, she's probably not going to be happy that I'm hanging out with her piglets. Yep. That's when you got to worry about is getting between mama and the babies. <laughs> do you guys do any uh, dog or hunting behind dogs for hogs out there? Uh, we've done it a few times with just some friends that have the dogs that, that are really good at it. And, and man, that's a whole different experience. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It can be a little gruesome because we, we usually stab the pig instead of shooting them, you know, with the dogs being there. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's effective. Like you're going to, those dogs are going to run them down. And, and so if you're trying to remove some pigs off the property, you can, you can uh, a couple times with dogs, you're going to put a dent in them, but um, but yeah, it's fun, man. We've got a few guys, some of those guys listed on the website to swap trips for that too. So if anybody has uh, interest in that, we could help them. Yeah, that's cool. So with the, with the website, is that like, can anybody hop on? Is it a subscription type of deal? How does that all work? Yeah. So we run off of a membership model. Um, and we don't, we do that for a couple of reasons. One, we didn't want to charge a transaction fee because if we did, it'd have to be a lot higher. Um, uh, because part of our goal is just, lowering that barrier to entry to, to the outdoors, like getting people access to the outdoors. And, um, you know, so the membership fee, we got a few different options there. It's, we got a monthly option, $12 a month. We got a annual option at 125 a year. And then we got a premium, which is 250 a year for, which is what most of our outfitters that work with us use because um, it comes with a little extra promotion of your trip. And, and some of those guys are trying to sell trips too, but um, so yeah, most of our guys are at 125 a year. And what we tell you is, is one, that's a huge credibility piece for us because it shows that people are serious about trading. You're not going to go to a forum and have Joe Blow on there. That's, um, you know, not going to fulfill his end of the deal, you know, nothing keeping him accountable, nothing. He just, you know, who knows he got on his phone one day and typed up a post and you're never going to hear from him again. So yeah. we, uh, you know, our guys, it takes a little bit more effort and a little bit of cash involved to, uh, to play. And so that helps with the credibility. Um, and then two, what we're saying is if you go on one trip in two years, three years, even you're going to save well over 125 bucks. So, oh yeah, uh, you know, so the savings there is substantially more than the cost, but, um, but yeah, we run off the membership model, no transaction fees. You can list as many trips as you want and you can go on as many swaps as you want. So, um, but 
for those that are still just kind of like on the fence, you can go on there and look at the trips and filter them and, and see what we have and what those people are interested in to kind of see if it's something you want to do. Yeah, that's awesome. Are you finding that a lot of these trips are on private land or are there public land options as well? So we got a little bit of everything. Um, I would say maybe nah, 80 to 90% of our hunting trips are probably private, whether that's a, just a private landowner, a hunting outfitter, um, you know, anything in the mix there. And then, but we do have a percentage that's doing public land as well, whether that's duck hunting or, you know, elk or whatever that may be. Um, guys that have just had a lot of experience on a public land ground and say, hey, we're going to go hunting this September for elk and you're more than welcome to tag along with us. I'm not guaranteed you'll kill anything like, but I do have 20 years of experience hunting this property and I can guarantee you I'll, I, you know, I've got enough knowledge that's going to be helpful, you know, yeah. so that that's valuable in itself somebody that just has knowledge of public land and, and people do swap that and you know they're just very clear that they're not a guide and this isn't a guaranteed hunt it's you know it's just going to be a good experience with a new hunting buddy that's cool now if you if you had to pick like if you could find one person to trade with what is your go-to like your top of the bucket list number one hunt that you would do I think mine right now is um, is probably caribou. Uh, I don't know with a bow. I think that'd just be pretty cool. Um, I know it's gonna take a lot to get in that, and we've um, we've got I think one or two trips on there, but um, hadn't you know had found the right swap. But one day, one day I'm gonna I'm gonna try to go on a caribou hunt, and then actually super excited about this September. Gonna be going to uh, Colorado with a guy on a elk hunt for um, an archery elk hunt. So. Um, he came down here. He's, he's came with me a few times hog hunting. And, um, and so he came this past spring, did a hog and turkey hunt. And so we're, I'm going to go up there and, and hopefully get my first elk with a bow. So I'm, I'm excited. He was sending me some, some video trail cam videos the other day of some real pretty six by six coming through. And I'm like, you know, got me excited. Got me fired up, man. There's something about elk hunting out West. Like they opened up a season here in Missouri now. But last year they only gave out like five tags, but yeah. out West, I mean, there's so many opportunities for people to just go out and hunt public land over the counter. Um, and I didn't think it was very accessible growing up in Wisconsin, just being a whitetail hunter in my mind, I'm like, dude, I got to pay $5,000 to go out and hunt an elk. When in reality, if you, I mean, especially now with trips for trade, getting the, that knowledge, if you don't know anybody who's already out there, you can trade a trip to a guy who can teach you how to elk hunt. And then in exchanges for coming out and whitetail hunting or doing something like that. And so that's amazing that, that you're going to be able to get out there this September and exactly, hopefully you man. get one, man, there's nothing like a screaming elk in your face. I'm telling you, <laughs> it, it's a whole different, it's like, everybody says it's like a big game Turkey hunt. Yeah, exactly. We've, we've got one of our investors that I filmed for on a few hunts and, uh, and got to, be the film guy on elk hunt, but not the guy behind the bow. So I'm excited to switch roles a little bit, man. It'll, it'll be fun. I see you got a few on the wall there. What, where, where are those from? Yeah. These guys are both from Colorado. Um, okay. my wife and I moved out there for two years and the first year I was hoping to get out in elk hunt. And I think we moved there in July, maybe, maybe it was later than that. And I went to Walmart to buy an elk tag, not knowing anything about the draw process. I was just like, Hey, I'm going to go buy an elk tag. And they're like, well, it's not really how it works. You know, we've got units, there's preference points. I'm like, I know nothing about this stuff. <laughs> and they were like, okay, it's going to be like $650. And I was like, wait, I thought it was 49 bucks for a resident. And they're like, yeah, but your license says that you've only been here four months. And I was like, yeah, I have. And they're like, oh, so you're not a resident until you're six months in. So I didn't get to hunt that whole first year. Um, oh, no. And then luckily that fall, I connected with some guys uh, just through waterfowl hunting. And we did yeah. a bunch of goose hunts together. And they were like, man, do you want to come out to elk camp with us? And I was like, yeah, yeah man, absolutely. So the following year, it was awesome. I got to pick up a $49 tag and went out and that's... Uh, that's this guy yeah uh, hey. to my right um shot him it was unreal you know we we did like 45 minutes on a four-wheeler that morning 
got out and spotted him at about a thousand yards with a whole herd of elk or a, a whole herd of cows and satellite bulls. And then, yeah. uh, it was just a wild hunt anyways, ended up taking him. And then the following year went out and got this one right here, as well as a mule deer. I ended up shooting them on the same day, which was yeah. cool. Yeah. Cause my whole, my whole goal that year, I wanted to shoot a black tail deer. I wanted to shoot a mule deer and a white tail. And so we went to Alaska in early August, shot a black tail, and then that fall got the mule deer and then finished up with two white tail bucks in Missouri. So man, record year right there. That's it, awesome. Oh man, it was unbelievable. I told Sam, I was like, I might as well, my wife is Sam. I was like, I might as well give it up. Like I'm never going to top this year, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully soon. My, my next goal, I mean, my number one is a moose. I want to, I want a moose hunt in like the Alaskan Yukon and just get out there with a bow, maybe do a combo like moose, caribou and bear hunt, something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Man, It'd be a lot yeah, of fun. That'd be awesome, dude. Heck Have you know, been up to a... pretty supportive of all the adventures from the TikToks I've seen, huh? She, <laughs> yeah. She supports you pretty good. <laughs> we, we joke around quite a bit about it because we know that's a pain point for a lot of hunters is, you know, being married, especially with kids and, not being able to get out as much, but she realizes how valuable that time is for me. I mean, that's something I grew up since I was able to walk. I knew about hunting and it was helping, you know, drag yeah. deer as much as I was probably getting in the way, but um, <laughs> she loves it. Now my kids love it. I shot two does down here this year, um, right down from my house. And so she brought the kids both out and they helped me go and look for them. And that's yeah, great. it's, it's a whole family deal. She actually got her first deer this year, so she's kind of getting into it. I'm trying to connect her with more female hunters, but yeah. uh, yeah, she's enjoying it. That's awesome, man. Well, I love to hear that. What, uh, are you mainly archery or, or rifle or what? Uh, both. I mean, I've got a huge emphasis on archery right now. Um, I just love it. I fell in love with that. As soon as I picked up a bow, I was like, this is what it's all about. Yeah. And then moving down here to Missouri, not knowing anybody, uh, not having any permission on land, not knowing, like in Wisconsin, I had never hunted public land because my family grew up rifle hunting and mm -hmm. there's so many people out there with guns and they were just like, listen, we're not about to go on public land during rifle season. Like you're liable to get shot. Yeah. And so when I came down here, I just didn't even, I didn't hunt for a couple of years here. I would always go back up to Wisconsin and do it. But then I got connected with some people out here, started asking for permission. Um, and then we lived on property or we rented a house on property. So then I had access to that neighbors gave me permission. And so now I've been hunting the same property here for probably six or seven years. Okay. And it's been cool because I've never been able to manage deer before and like to actually yeah. see them grow. And, you know, I name them all and, <laughs> Some people are like, why do you name them? But I, I just like to be able to identify <laughs> them. And when I'm talking to buddies, like, hey, man, this is what this is which deer I'm talking about. But anyways, yeah. I'm going to start getting into public land. I really want to start doing public land. And like you were talking about earlier, the urban hunting. Yeah, um, there's something something about that. And I want to get into saddle hunting as well. So okay. is that yeah. is that what you use when you go out in these urban areas? I have it, man. I've um. I've got some several buddies that do, and I think it uh, could be really effective. I've actually personally never, uh, never tried it. Um, we actually, we are sponsoring an event this end of this month um, where the saddle, they're doing like a saddle show and tail deal. But, um, but yeah, I've, I've been thinking about it. I, I work with, with summit uh, stands a lot. So I use a lot of their lock-ons on climbers. So that's pretty much been my go-to, but, but that saddle hunting, it looks like it can be pretty effective. Yeah. And I mean, I know, I don't know how it is down in Alabama. Do you guys have a bunch of like the tall pine trees? I mean, straight up and down. That's, the, yeah. that's amazing when you can get into that here. It's like a jungle, man. Every tree is sideways and twisted. And I tried to do a public land hunt last year with a climber. And it took me like an hour and a half just to find a tree that I could get that stand in. And I said, forget yeah. this. I'm going to a saddle next year. And so I need to pick that up soon because I can't believe how quick the fall is creeping in. It's here. It's about here, man. Yeah, we, uh, a lot of ours, like we even hunt Illinois public and, um, and even Tennessee some, and it's, 
but we just do the hanging hunts. I mean, we'll, we'll take a, a lock on with some climbing sticks and, and you're, it gives you a little bit more flexibility. Um, but I think, I think the saddle just takes it one step further. It sounds like. Yeah. I've, I've watched all the videos and stuff and it seems great. I've never actually put one on and been in a tree to see how I like it. But for the longest time, when I go out and hang my stands like preseason, I'll, I'll bring my rock climbing harness and I'll just basically use that as a saddle. I've been doing that for years, not even knowing what a saddle was. And that way I can just hang from the tree and have two hands free as I'm hanging my stand. And now people are like, well, why don't you just hunt out of the rock climbing harness? I'm like, oh yeah, I guess that would have been the smart play from the beginning. <laughs> no doubt, man. I have to try it out. So tell me, tell me a little bit about the urban hunting because you had referenced it before we started the podcast and I am very intrigued by it. It sounds like there are monsters growing in a lot of cities around the country. Yeah, it's, it's got a real big boom. Uh, the Seek One guys at Atlanta, I've got to be like several close with Lee and, um, and he's, you know, he's just a pro at him and his guys, Drew, they, they've been doing it for, I don't know, like 15 years in Atlanta and um, kind of showed the world how it's done. But um, but yeah, they, these cities, they just grow giants with the kind of the urban creep, you know, all these, um, all these developments pushing these deer into smaller pockets and they're just starving. I mean, there's, there's too many deer, so it needs to happen. The management from a, from a management standpoint, there needs to be the suburban hunting. And um, then on top of that, it's, it's fun, man. It's a whole different strategy. Like I, I mentioned earlier, I grew up on a family farm and kind of had access to a bunch of property, very fortunate there, but um but I love going and trying to find these little small spots in the city that's not being hunted and, and can grow big deer. And that's really the strategy behind trying to find a big deer and um, then figure out how to kill him. And there's, there's so many other variables that come into it, but, um, but yeah, man, it's, it's really fun. We, I, I had some success in Tuscaloosa last year and some in Birmingham the year before that here in Alabama. And, um, and then this year we've got some spots in Nashville and probably do some hunting in Atlanta as well. So um, I've, I've got addicted to it, man. I think kind of was talking to Lee the other day. I was like a lot of even had some buddies that, you know, really shunned you for it early on. And it's like, now they're trying. And then, and really he's like, man, I just tell everybody don't knock it till you try it. Cause, uh, once you, once you get a taste of it, you're going to realize how fun it is and, um, and how challenging it is to get a new spot. And cause you, you might knock on 50 doors just to get one. Yes. And then you're just fired up to see, like, I just got a new property and see what's on it. And, and kind of my mindset with it, I was mentioning this briefly earlier, is my whole mentality is just like, man, it it is really just not taking no for an answer. Like it's it's trying to, if you want something, work hard enough to go get it. And and I think that that kind of plays into the business role a little bit too. But but for from hunting, like I grew up on a farm where if you didn't have a big deer, you just waited till next year. And now it's like with a suburban hunt, and if you don't have a big deer, just go spend a day, work your butt off, knock on a bunch of doors and and get access and try to find a big deer to go hunt that next year. So, um, so I just love how it's, it, it kind of plays into my personality there and, and just kind of drive to, to be successful. So uh, it's a lot of fun, man. You need to, you need to dive into it a little bit this year. I think I'm going to, and I, I discovered, I found what I think is the perfect technique for getting new property. And it was bringing my wife out. Um, <laughs> I, I took her out and she's a real real cute girl and she had all her camo on she's done up and we went to two different places and it was just for one day of rabbit season that's all I wanted I wanted to take her and another guy out running beagles and yeah she came out in the very first place we went they were like oh yeah absolutely you can hunt this part this portion of the property and over here we've got more property and do you guys waterfowl hunt do you kayak hunt do you do you deer hunt? They're like, anytime you want, you can just come out, just park by the gate, make sure you close the cattle gates. And I'm like, I, <laughs> all I had, to, all I asked was one day of rabbit hunting. And I just got permission for a couple hundred acres for whatever I want. And then we went to a second property and the exact same thing happened there. And I'm like, how did I just triple my hunting property here in Missouri? Yeah, just by bringing great. my wife out, you know, we've asked before and gotten turned down plenty of times, me and my cousin going around like, Hey, you see a bunch of big turkeys in your back 40, you know, <laughs> does anybody hunt there? And we've been turned down, but I haven't been turned down yet with her. So I think I that's going to be my go-to this year. <laughs> it helps. We we're, were thinking, I think we're going to do a little bloopers video this year, talking about knocking on doors and like different strategies and 
um and just like that bring that bring some kids with you one time bring your grandmother with you one time you know like whatever it may be just to uh just to add some humor to it but but it's fun man but yeah that that helps i we we've done that a few times uh i've I've taught my girlfriend into riding with me or um or even before just i had a, a another girl that i was friends with and helping her get her own spots and 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 she seemed to be more successful than i was so yeah uh they, something about it they got a little way to, of getting things they want you know they really do it's been <laughs> it's been fun getting her into hunting and just kind of teaching her how things happen because it, it kind of reignites the passion for me too like when i'm just going through basic stuff and uh right before i hopped on with you i was checking trail cameras and uh there was this buck that came in i call him snake bite he's got like two dots on his rib cage don't know what okay. what it's from but I'm watching him and it was a video and all of a sudden he perked up and looked one way and then he was gone in the next video. And I go, I bet you any money, a coyote's coming in. And sure enough, a minute later, a coyote enters and she's like, how do you, how did you know that? That's like psychic. I'm like, well, I mean, once you learn deer and learn their body language and how they respond to certain things, you can kind of figure it out, put two and two together. And so she's learning that and she is loving it. There's something about like just getting new people into it. Like that's for me, that's the progression of hunting. Like once you've done it, not that I've mastered it by any means, but once I've done it, like the next stage is just to get more people involved. So that's one of my favorite things. We're super passionate about that too, man. Just getting people outdoors and trying new things. And, um, you know, that's the future of it. You gotta, we gotta make sure that the next generation is getting out there and, and people are learning. And there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of unknown there. I think that's a reason that we've seen declines in different areas because people are just like, oh, there's so much. Like, how do I learn all this? And you really need a mentor and somebody showing you. And um, that's something that we kind of tell people with Trips for Trade is you're not just booking, you know, you're not just going on a public land DIY Colorado elk hunt. You know, you're going with a guy that's going to teach you the ropes and show you things. And it's going to be cheaper than if you paid an outfitter, but you're going to still kind of have that experience of a host or a guide. And, um, and you know that's that's just how you learn like it's a it's a easier way to try something new than just paying a ton of money to go pay an outfitter and like i mean when we work with a lot of outfitters we promote outfitters and um but it just doesn't make sense for everybody especially not everybody for their first time that might not have the money to do that yeah i mean it's it's definitely intimidating like getting into something new even going to alaska luckily we knew some people up there and and we went up and stayed with them but I was like not knowing anything about the process up there of buying a tag, what all you have to do. Cause in some States, I mean, there's not very strict um, meat harvest requirements. Like you can leave a good chunk of the deer out there, unfortunately, but in Alaska, it's like, I had to read through the whole brochure and they told me they're like every year we read through the whole thing because things change, but like having to take all the meat from in between the ribs, the neck meat all the way up to the skull. Like you just, not knowing that stuff it's intimidating so having something like what you've got where people can teach you when you go to an out-of-state hunt or or even an in-state hunt when you've never hunted before that's a huge help absolutely man yep that's uh it it definitely takes a lot of the pressure off and you enjoy the trip a little bit more when you're not stressing over oh i hope i'm doing everything right or hope i don't you know miss any rules regulations or uh anything like that or even like you know, the guy I'm swapping with in Ohio this upcoming season, it's like having somebody there that knows the area and um, has experience and uh, can help put corn out or run cameras or whatever it may be. Like, that's that's all super valuable. Yeah. Um, now, I hate to bring this up. I haven't talked about COVID, I think, a single time on this podcast yet. But when you were talking about permissions, I was kind of curious, have you guys seen an effect – from COVID on getting permission on property and even just like approaching people about getting permission. Cause for us, I've been hesitant now to go up to doors just cause I don't know what their stance is. You know, do I need to go up fully masked and like, <laughs> <laughs> do you need a vaccine yeah. card now asking people for permission? <laughs> I bet um, just this summer in Nashville, two trips to Nashville, I've probably knocked on 150 doors, maybe 200 doors. Um, and didn't wear a mask on any of them and probably had maybe five people that I think they stood behind their screen door just for that reason, you know? So to answer your question, I don't think it's, that's the last thing on somebody's mind when somebody's not a random person's knocking on their door. They're, 
they're more like, why are you here and what do you want versus okay. why are you not wearing a mask? <laughs> yeah. That's good. But, I, uh, yeah, this, this next month I'm going to be getting out and knocking on a couple doors and we've got some really cool places here. They actually do, um, like urban hunt programs to where you can get, you can apply to go to some of the city parks and stuff and hunt deer. And I'm talking like, you're walking down a trail in some of these nature centers and there's deer five feet from you and some monster bucks. And so they, they actually make you apply to hunt there. Um, and so I, I want to do that this year, especially, um, but just getting new permission. That was one thing that I was very concerned about. Cause you know, if you're out in public at a store, people look at you funny. If you don't have a mask on, even now I still get funny looks, but I was like, I can't imagine walking up to somebody's door who's just like freaked out about COVID and they're like, get off my property. I did see a couple doors that actually had signs like, please do not approach the house. And I was like, well, wrong place to ask. Yeah, I think, you know, us being here in Alabama and even up in Tennessee, I think it's a little less, from my understanding, it's a little less strict than it is maybe up around your way and especially even further north or some some bigger city areas, but, um, but things have pretty much, you know, for the most part about back to normal here. Um, you know, people are still taking precautions and all, but, but it, thankfully it's not top. It's not, it's not what everybody's talking about or thinking about now. That's good. So, so you said you've got uh, a hunt plan in Nashville. Where else are you planning on hunting this fall? Got a busy calendar right now. Um, if the Canadian border opens up, we'll plan to go up there for a few days or for a couple of weeks, actually. Um, we've got in a, one of our investors, again, I filmed for him and he's uh, he's just became a really good friend. So I, I film a lot of his hunts and guide for him at his farm in Alabama. But um, so we'll be doing Canada, hopefully for primarily the mule deer, but he also has tags for whitetail, elk, and bear so that'll be awesome we did that two seasons ago and man it was incredible um then i think we'll be going to i'll be going to colorado to film him and um maybe october i believe i'll be going myself on a swap in september then we'll be doing ohio for archery doing nashville for archery maybe atlanta um and then yeah a lot a lot here in alabama so it's we got a lot coming up this for this bow season for sure. That's awesome. What what's your season like there in Alabama? How when does it start? And when does it go till? So for deer, um, around October fifteenth is when archery comes in, and it goes to February the tenth. Um, okay. So we've you know, we've got a really long season. You can kill three bucks, um, kill as many does as you want, and you know it's not like a a tag application or anything. You know you just buy your license over the counter and. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty good, man. We've got really good hunting. Uh, just, you know, finding really big deer can be, uh, can be a little bit harder than, especially where you guys are from, but, um, but they're around, you know, we've, I've got a buddy that, that hunts the suburbs of Birmingham and he shot a 199 and some change this past year with his bow. I mean, just a, you know, freak, freak, but so there's some good ones around and, um, you know, definitely got some 150 pluses, uh all over the state you just got to find them that's crazy to see the the size comparison between like the suburban deer and then the deer out in the country like in order to find a deer of that caliber out in the country i mean you might have to have a couple hundred acres and do serious food plot and habitat improvement and all that stuff whereas i mean like you said lee he's he's killed three 200 plus inch deer already and He's just outside of Atlanta. And I know that, I mean, from the podcast that I listened to him on, I think it sounded like they brought some of the genetics with them from Wisconsin when they, when they repopulated deer down there. But I hear stories about it all across the country right now. I think the number one um, mule deer population, the highest density of mule deer is in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Really? And you can see it when you're driving through Colorado <laughs> Springs, like, there will be those big concrete walls along the highway and there's just bucks bedded in between the highway and 10, 10 yards of grass just bedded along those, those strips. Yeah, it's true. crazy, man. No doubt. Yeah. I've got the guy that I swapped with in Colorado. He lives in, um, 
I think he lives in Colorado. He might live in, I think he lives in Colorado Springs. But anyway, whatever the city lives in right there, he's he sends me mule deer in his backyard all the time, you know, walking up, eating the flowers and all. And it's like, I don't think they can hunt in his little city, but it's like, it's unreal. You know, it's 175 inch mule deer just, you know, chilling in the, in the neighborhood They're They're overpopulated. That's for sure. Yeah. It's becoming, I mean, it's becoming an issue with all the different species out there. The elk are dropping down into the cities now. Um, I've got some friends who work downtown Fort Collins and they sent me a video of yeah. a five by five elk just running down the middle of the street in Fort Collins. Um, they're out on the golf courses. There was a mountain lion uh, in the middle of the city not long ago. I mean, just some crazy, crazy encounters. But that's what happens when when people infringe on their habitat. You know, they've got nowhere to go, and then they have to learn to coexist. And actually, they end up thriving a lot in the cities. Yeah, it's it's crazy, man. I mean, we're yeah, we're. We act like it's crazy for us, but it's, uh, you know, it, we're, like I said, we're encroaching on their, their territory. So, you know, it's, you're bound to have encounters like that. Oh yeah. There, I just saw a video. Actually, I've seen a couple of them now. There's a guy, I'm guessing he's in Colorado. I didn't see where he was from, but he goes out of his house and he's got a door that goes from his house to his garage. And every morning he opens up that door. And there's about a dozen mule deer standing in his garage, just waiting for him. And he goes out there and he pets him and he'll give him like some breakfast food or cereal or whatever. And like, they just, <laughs> they just learn that people, you know, in that, in that area aren't a threat because they can't be hunted. Yep. It's wild, man. Heck well, yeah. Well, you got to try it out this year and see, uh, see if you can get land somewhere proper sounds like from talking before though you've got you got your hands full already with with some deer you've been watching so hopefully you're gonna have a big season this year yeah i might be i mean i might be forced to find more property in a hurry i actually got news um last thursday that the gentleman who owns the bulk of the property that i hunt passed away um he was getting up there in age and so we've got his funeral tomorrow but i don't know what's going to happen with his his land um and so I still have this 20 acres. I've got a bunch of friends who are buying little chunks of property here and there, but um, I'm going to, I'm going to have to start scouting more places and if nothing else, public land stuff, but that urban hunt, man, I'm telling you, there was an old abandoned airport that we used to ride four wheelers and take trucks back in. Um, and we'd see monster bucks like 170 just out there. I mean, like walking the old runways that are covered in grass now, <laughs> and when I, when I see that stuff, I'm like, this is prime hunting. Like they have nowhere else to go. Otherwise they're hitting people's six foot privacy fence. Um, or, you know, like just in their backyard, but it seems like every neighborhood on the outskirts of the city here is just loaded with deer and Turkey. And so that might be where I focus my efforts instead of going out in the country. I might just start asking right on the, right on the fringes of Springfield and see what I can come up with. Absolutely, man. Johnny Morris might, you know, I'm like I said, you're going to run in a bunch of his property, but aside from that, you might find a few pieces. <laughs> oh yeah. There, there's stuff all over the place. And I mean, I've, I've tried what I've discovered is most companies, like there's a lot of companies around here that alone, you know, a small chunk of land or a woodlot. And most of those guys don't let me for liability reasons. That's the answer I always get. But when yeah. it comes to a, a private residence, then I think they're a lot more open to it. Yep. Well, good luck with it, man. I hope, uh, hope you find some stuff. That'd be awesome. You have to keep yeah. me posted. Send me some, some, some trail cam pics if you land anything. Yeah. I'll send you, uh, once we hop off here in a second, I'll, I'll send you some pictures of what I've got out here and then we can really talk about maybe swapping, <laughs> a, <laughs> trading a hunt. Um, but man, I appreciate, man. I appreciate you hopping on with me and I want to give you an opportunity to just share where people can find you, uh, find, find the website and how they can get involved with that. Yeah, absolutely. So the website is just tripsfortray.com, and that's the number four. Um, and then you can go on there, like I said, and view the different membership options, view all the trips, see if it's something you want to do. And um, if so, if you have any questions or are on the fence, and reach out to me at Slade, S-L-A-D-E, at tripsfortray.com, or uh, my, my personal number is on there as well, 205-499-3858. So Happy to be a resource. Um, you know, if you got just something you want to talk through or want to do some trade and we'd love, we'd love to help you guys out. And you said you've got uh, a YouTube channel and you're going to hope you're hoping to do a bunch more um, recording this summer or this fall. 
Yeah, so we do. We're um, at Trister Trade on YouTube. We might, um, a lot of the recording might be on a personal page that we launch just because it'll be more than just swapping stuff that we'll be filming, but uh, but we'll be relaying a lot of that over to Trips for Trade. And, um, but yeah, all, all of our social accounts are at Trips for Trade. We post a lot, a lot of our new trips on Instagram, you know, about every day we're posting new trips for you to check out. So definitely follow us there and kind of at least pique your interest on uh, some, some cool bucket list trips that might excite you. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And I'm going to give you the final word. I call this one unloading the chamber. Um, so this segment, you can just share whatever you want, a final word to the listeners. Yeah, man. Well, I, I guess my final word would be is just, you know, make the most of your experiences. We're a company that's all about experiences. And I think, um, you know, while we're here on earth, I'm a big believer, like we need to make the most of our time here and experience that with, with people and build those relationships. And, um, and I, I don't think you can get much stronger of a relationship unless you have some really cool experiences. So we're, uh, we're in the experience business. So we'd love to help you guys make some experiences, check some things off the bucket list and um, be able to do it a little bit more affordable than you thought you could and, and really just build those relationships. So uh, if we can be a resource, man, just We'd love to do that at Trips for Trade. That's awesome, man. Well, I definitely appreciate you hopping on with me, sharing sharing what you guys are offering um, with my listeners. And um, I definitely want to connect. And I'm going to be getting a membership here soon. I'm going to go share with my wife that my hunting budget just went up a hair, but it's going to pay off in the long run. So. Heck yeah, man. What we'll do is, too, is we got to uh, – I'll let everybody know we got a code. Just use T4T20. Um, and that'll save you 20% on the membership. So any listeners want to take advantage of that, um, you know, feel free. And uh, we look forward to hooking you up as well. You got to open invite to Alabama, man. We'll have to get you down here and, and, uh, and test the waters on it. That sounds awesome, man. I, I can't wait. I'm super pumped about that. <laughs> well, thanks again for hopping on. Um, and yeah, thank you guys for listening. Perfect. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me.